urban designer, planner, preservationist, and everything you can think of in terms of uh, the physical environment and taking care of old monuments. Please uh, welcome Mr. Ronald Lee coming. I just had talk at 76 and it's pretty good, but I don't, I don't know what you're going to do tonight. All right. Well, it's good to be here for the first time. Yeah. Yeah. Let's see. Uh, I'm going to be here. I've heard all the jokes about Middletown, so I won't uh, discuss uh, that, but I am reacting to two hours of touring around and looking at uh, the city and what's happened to it over time. And I'm here. I, my own work, I've done a lot of street state revitalization projects. Um, and so I'm fascinated by the way the street state changes in the community. So years ago, uh, I used to send small teams of architects and contractors in New England communities without, which did not have any training or staff or capability. And we would encourage the merchants to peel off the layers of, of aluminum and asphalt shingle uh, that often covered up the of the building. And this is sort of early townscape uh, work uh, I see now happening around the country. And I just toured the downtown uh, center, the storefront, uh, where several uh, members of the faculty are working on downtown revitalization charrette. And I was extremely impressed with uh, how they were working coming along, although monthly there appears to be much material uh, left to, uh, to work on. Uh, I thought that there was a, a whole history of the master movement and uh, the uh, glass panels of the 50s and the uh, sort of rock and board and batten uh, frontier look uh, that sort of taken over some of those handsome late 19th century, early 20th century buildings. I think probably the best way to revitalize the downtown would be to move part of the student body uh, into some of those old buildings. I gather 90% of the upper floors are not uh, being used right now. Uh, it might be worth exploring as a policy option by this university, renovating some of those dormitories and using perhaps the renovation of the building to supervise. Uh, certainly in terms of creating downtown life, uh, two or three thousand people living in the downtown would make a very dramatic difference. I know some happened to some extent in Santa Cruz, California, which went through a similar kind of mall treatment. In fact, it's about a lush mall, just a river for my take. Uh, but now, with a lot of people living in the downtown, uh, it's becoming a big vital place. And there's more than one place to buy cross on. But I think there's one here, and I tend to go there tomorrow morning. Uh, but I guess it's the beginning, and it's, I think it's a sign of hope. Uh, because for many years you know, in this society, we've suffered from the energy loss. And the energy loss has been, of course, a series of, of policy decisions, whether or not we call them a policy or not. They led to the disintegration of the uh, inner core of our city. And uh, we subsidized that disintegration with interstate highways, uh, with a uh, lack of comprehensive land use planning, with uh, easily available single family mortgages. And we're seeing the consequence of that. The consequence, I think, has been uh, the destruction of the urban place. Now, the work that I'm doing uh, is not really related to that larger problem. In a sense, you could call it something of a thrill to be concerned with a particular mental landscape of those places. Oh, I understand there's still a kind of a constituency for that interest here in Muncie. I discovered that, that once a week there's a column in the local newspaper which uh, sort of recollect what happened, what buildings were used for what in the downtown. And I think that there's a very strong uh, feeling of nostalgia in this country for a, a mental landscape of association. And my message tonight really is to ask how urban designers and architects and planners, which all of you are, I assume, trained to be or interested in, how you can use that mental landscape in your own work. Uh, what I'm going to do is sort of focus on some very simple principles that we've developed in the last several years, and then show them examples of projects where they've been applied. I should say that this work is part of the uh, 
Pittsburgh of the Townscape Institute, a public interest organization in Cambridge, Massachusetts, which I run. Uh, I've been working in this kind of uh, project now for several years, but it started, as I said earlier, with streetscape design. And the process, in the last three years, we've begun to publish some of the work that we've been involved with and some of the results that other people have gotten around the country. And the result of that is a series of books called The Power of Place. And I was delighted to find that some of the faculty had actually uh, looked at them. I'm not sure they've written, but it's very encouraging indeed. Uh, the book that specifically relates to tonight's talk, which is the first of the series, is called Placemakers, Public Art That Tells You Where You Are. Uh, it's published by Hastings Mountain, New York. And it's a privilege to join me with my, my wife and colleague, Renato von Charter. But it also comes with two other books, one called The Thought Story, and the other one is called On Common Ground, which is the subject of the exhibit, which is out here. And I have another lecture on that exhibit, but I think we'll probably be pretty much occupied with slight pages of the So that is an introduction. Uh, let me ask someone to sit down for the light and turn on the slide projector, and I'll ask them any lectures before me will. Uh, Overweight, uh, sitting 
in their isolated uh, chairs, uh, thinly spread over the landscape, socioeconomic layers, no longer grasping the capable of carrying on a vain conversation. And all of that, I feel, is disintegration of any sense of cultural accountability or responsibility. And that larger issue of cultural responsibility and accountability that I, that I feel we as designers must address in our work. I said that I started by doing projects which involve facade or line changes. This is the before shot, thanks to Wade in Chelsea, Massachusetts, the blue collar community in Boston, which is run over by that highway, burned out by a great fire in the state. And psychologically, we're kind of at the bottom of the, the list of cities in the state, lowest per capita income. We were able to use a $3 million revitalization grant from the from EDA, the Economic Development Administration, uh, to change the physical appearance of that streetscape. But what I really want to relate to you is this other process that went on as a result of being uh, in that environment. And that was the process of beginning to learn something about the community and beginning to understand that we could plant a lot of trees and do some brick sidewalks and do all those kinds of things that we did. I mean, it was successful dramatically and still not have anything to do with the way these people felt about themselves. They had really no memory over a whole series of layers of people that had come into the community in the first place. So it started out being uh, Yankee, then it became Irish, then it became Italian, and Jewish, and Lithuanian, and Puerto Rican. Um, and each of these groups sort of didn't respect or have very much to do with the other group. We were trying to give people a sense of mutualism, back to mutual accountability. We found that the idea of doing something to bring back that memory of the place was extremely important in that setting. How do you do that with a, a grant with three trees and a brick sidewalk given by a federal agency? But we invented something called pedestrian orientation. We wanted to have something called public art. We wanted to have two percent for public art and interpretation, but that was not a given line item in the budget of the time. So we had to think of another way of getting those dollars. And here Mark is for a, a system of those emblems of meaning, uh, which would be different from our original assignment. So looking at this space right here, we said we'd like to do a memory wall, a photo album for the city in that spot, which would help bind the city back together. They didn't even have uh, a record. Everything had been burned in this fire in 1908, and there wasn't a short society or a place in the library where you could go. The library burned down. So we used the 2% of our, of our grant for a series of things. The first of them was a memory wall, and this is the way it looks when it's finished. It's a series of Portland enamel panels, uh, which we use not only to talk about events, but also to talk about people, and to talk about the changing condition of the place. We show that people had very different views of this place in 1840, with the resort and And we found that there were all kinds of people who uh, lived in Korea, various other people. And these were all kinds of devices giving people a sense of dignity and connection. These are done in Portland and Apple panels, silk screen panels. It's not expensive. We decided we would take the history right up to the present time. This man on the left here is a photographer who's been on that main street for 40 years. He's an immigrant from Romania. He makes a living by taking pictures. Somehow or other, he develops this picture in three minutes. And the pocket of his coat, which he wears even on a hot August day, here he is photographing the local residents. So he became part of the memory of this place and was incorporated uh, with into, into the uh, memory wall he saw a minute ago. And he even had a baby competition where he could uh, take pictures of the baby and uh, gave him a little extra money and allowed us to show the most recent player, the, the uh, Portuguese and the uh, Puerto Rican. So you're probably wondering what these are. And this is another part of that project. There are a series of some 70 bronze crafts we had a sculptor do in yeah. Japan. And they commemorate, we thought, the fact that the fish was sold in the central market on 
square to your renovation. And you sort of jump over them as you walk up the platform. But you know, I was giving a talk uh, about this project in Minnesota a couple of years ago. Mine, and he 
didn't realize that the branch would be covered with crystals that would collect around the branch. And he saw that the, the Nautilus uh, could invent a mental world in which objects that were used in the, uh, in the, in the book uh, would have associations that would cluster around them. And I think that we as designers would do the same thing, we use the same technique. When Bruce talked about taking the mandolin cookie and breaking it and then recovering the memories of his childhood, becoming his aunt in Cold Gray, inserting tea. And just by smelling this uh, biscuit years later, he recovered all of those experiences that he had as a child. I think we can use the same kind of uh, mechanism uh, in a physical application through a process of embedding objects in that environment, which can help people to recover their own past and perhaps more important, to reinvent them. Now, these are some of the uh, points that I want to talk about. The first one is the mental landscape, which I think I've outlined in the last few minutes. But I think there are a number of other points here that have to be uh, looked at in terms of figuring out a way of using a placement strategy effectively. And they are the idea of animation, the idea of a particular kind of contribution that the artist can make, which I don't think the designer can make, although there are a lot of designers who make good artists. Uh, the idea of creating something that's participatory that people can add their own layer to. Uh, the idea of providing a level of detail and craftsmanship that is pretty much missing from the way we're even trained in architectural schools today. I probably haven't been trained since the time of both are. And finally, the notion of being able to add things over time so that you build up increments, which is a whole different way of thinking, a much more sharper way of thinking than the idea of design today where you do the program and create the building and if you can't use that way usually it can't be recycled and have to tear down and start over again. <clears throat> now there are a set of criteria that I would apply uh, in this kind of work and I'll illustrate some of the following slides and examples of them. But I make uh, no bones about it. Obviously we're going to make this connection to the place. We're trying for a, a, a mobile use just as we're trying to use buildings mobile use for trying to use environments in a way that they, by mobile use, you build up layers of meaning. Again, the idea of involving the community in it, the idea of relating to a particular context, something missing from, I think, in most public art, uh, where the object is on the front arbitrarily to a space. I can think of some examples of that on the camera too. And finally, and a, a very uh, perhaps blitzing point, but I think pragmatic, that is to support, you know, whatever you do, should support or reinvent it. Now, you've probably seen recently, you know, in the most, I think, the most, uh, the last issue of our technical record, a review of the work of a group in New York called Sight. And I think the Sight people, in a very dramatic way, have tried to evoke places. And starting with this best product store in Richmond, uh, which is a warehouse on the very edges of Serbia. You see how they have evoked in this new building a feeling of a forest that used to be on the site. The forest is a straight away a parking lot to put this place. There's actually a new warehouse behind that crack which you walk through this sort of uh, facade and then you draw the wooden bridge to the forest and kind of drawing up through it. Then you are in the new building. It's the most dramatic way of recovering uh, the of a natural place. Here you, here you are. <laughs> here, a much simpler idea, this involving the work of an artist in Boston, um, Meg Perry. He did this piece with the bicentennial, and it, in a market, uh, the sort of Italian market next to the North End, the Van Hall Market area, it's in a crosswalk, the Freedom Trail is on your right. Existing design element, if you will, that two strips of brick follow you all over Boston and they take you on a sort of trip. But they're very kind of boring. There's nothing that really interprets that environment except a few flat. Meg Harris came up with a piece that's half in bronze, which in fact is garbage, including all newspapers that have some interesting stories about uh, the racial battles in Boston and various other things. Her like Daniel Grinship on his Boston, which caused some controversy for her. But the piece itself, twice a week, 
cut the real bars in half market. So if he takes out the church, this is a recent piece that we completed last summer uh, on a neighborhood scale in a blue collar neighborhood in the north of uh, Cambridge called Ridge Field. And this is a baseball field. The neighborhood wanted to do some kind of enhancement. We were able to get a percentage for public art as a city requirement. I'm the chairman of the one percent of public art commission in Cambridge, the first commission, I believe, uh, in New England. And we only had a few dollars, I think, about ten thousand dollars. And we were able to do something that served the needs of the community. It serves as a kind of visual backstop to the uh, baseball diamond. And it commemorates the community in a very special way. Uh, the, the figure on the right is a uh, brick maker, and this was a place where, in the early days, Irish immigrants came to the country and worked in the brickyards that were actually on the site. The figure on the left is a ball player because a lot of the sons of brick makers got athletic scholarships on this field and went off to Washington College, more famous as the Chip O'Neill, Speaker of the House of Representatives, who still lives in this neighborhood. He came back. Vote in a way that I could never do, not coming to the neighborhood. Uh, the connection that he felt was quite, quite extraordinary to hear him speak. And in a sense, it allowed us to take uh, out this kind of idea as a new direction for public art at the neighborhood scale, something that's been pretty much neglected by the National Endowment for the Arts and the General Services Administration, which provides a lot of money for art on new federal projects. They're hard break figures. What perhaps more unique about them, you see Tip O'Neill pointing to it, is that each of these bricks around the base and around the drinking fountain, which again was part of the project, is very pragmatic, all of the youth's idea, not art, it's actually for its own sake, but to serve the community. Uh, Tip is pointing to the name of his grandfather, who was a brick maker, before he was a town, city councilman. And uh, all the families that still live in this area have their names in brick. That's probably the thing that has created a feeling of proprietorship about this piece. It's a very simple thing, and we would not have gotten this right if there hadn't been a series of meetings with the community with the artist who was required to listen. His first idea was to do a car brick figure, but it was he didn't know what it was going to be, and then it became a brick maker and a ball player after a series of meetings with the community. Talk about the idea of animation being part of the strategy for place making. I think that's extremely important to think about how the place is going to be used. And this is a kind of rare example of that. She opened a new Hyatt Hotel in Cambridge, and a piece of art was commissioned, which went with a new dance piece. So the dance piece was performed, and the sculpture became the prop of the dance piece. Here's another interesting dance piece. Done in the pavement, and it's a you know, series of, uh, of uh, sidewalk inserts by the bus stop. There are some twelve of them done by artists using a percentage of the, of the regular streetscape revitalization money. That means they're all uh, in bronze now, the drawing. And you can actually follow the numbers and do a dance. They should be do a dance in eight of them. But they were very fun. They, they opened up the project. The Arthur Murray Dance Studio came out and did a 2,000 foot conga line along the street. And now on Saturday, if you go back to the street gate, there is a self appointed guy who buys a $3 a ticket. And this gives you a chance to learn the history of each of these dances and the pavement at the bus stop. And the new ticket also provides you for eating at 10 different restaurants along the street. So in a kind of curious way, that again, we never thought of web designers, it's a kind of way of uh, revitalizing, supporting uh, businesses along the street. Uh, the idea of using design in a, in a very utilitarian way, of taking those line items in your budget that are just for things like gates, for flowers, and posts, Turning those over to an artisan or an artist, so you begin to with a low again as we worked in this country, a sense of mystery, a sense of, uh, of wit, uh, of whimsy, uh, in the 
in all details of the environment. It takes time and it takes a process that we don't really have in place that I will describe in a moment. Here's another example. This is a new baller done with a, a new technique of uh, sandblasting. It's through a rubber mat. You cut out the pattern and you blast, uh, blast the sand and you can create this kind of pattern in about 15 minutes time. So it's a economically feasible thing to do. And this is one of about 12 different designs that are going to be on the baller. The baller is a small post to stop the cars from running over the desert which will be in a subway station uh, in Porter Square in Blue Power neighborhood, North Cambridge. And they will evoke uh, the patterns of the different uh, fabrics of seven different ethnic groups that live in this area, from Indians to French Canadians. And again, I think it speaks to that idea of crystallization. If you can look at that, it's a fairly subtle thing. It's not a big sign on it telling you what it is. But if your family can remember how to get tablecloths like that, it may evoke for you uh, Sunday speech and a whole set of images that are very private and yet which makes it quite accessible. Other aspects of urban design relate to the notion of physical context. This is a place where we're working in the old city hall in Boston, and this wonderful old gate we hope to repeat in a new rhythm of eventual, which will not be done like uh, hundreds of thousands of gas for the apartment that we created for ourselves all over America. But we'll take that same curly cube, go backwards, see in the top of the left and the right, and just evoke that as a design of the bench. Very simple little ideas like this. I talked earlier about the notion of participation. This is a uh, work of an artist in residence in a forgotten uh, new town called Glen Rock, which is outside of Glasgow. So this artist has been working for the last 10 years, his name is David Hardy. Public Works Department of this small uh, city should be directed by a city planner who believes in the notion of integrating the arts and the design, but also believes in the idea of people who sell should be adding their own layer. This is the answer why city architecture and design of the architecture of some of the architecture. But really, as you look over time, of course, the building arts have a very rich tradition in which cathedrals were built by teams of people, and only, only a few architects were involved. This is example of taking terracotta pieces and adding uh, to a schoolyard. What we'd like to see done is every year adding another layer to this thing so that people can go back and see a kind of progression of design ideas over the time. Another example of that is a Chinese uh, youth center in Oakland, California, where each child has their own little child. I'd like to see more projects where there are some walls that are left vacant at the end of the project encouraged to participate. That'd be a regular line item. Here's another one. This is a, a project that won an architectural award three years ago, Bella Victoria in Boston, largely Puerto Rican housing. But I think one of the things that you know, the architect never never thought about was taking the public power substation wall and turning it into this kind of a deck development. But on another side of the country, again in Seattle, seeing what you can do with another power substation where the gates of the substation have been turned over to an artist. The same amount of money that uh, Trace uh, the gates of the contract for said something about the very nature of electricity and power. I thought about taking something as mundane as a manhole cover. This one is again in Seattle, which has extremely progressive public art policy. Turning that into an art project, this is a yeah, map of downtown in Seattle, and there is a little steel button, I think over on the right hand side there, which is elevated up a little bit, and your foot brushes can polish that, and that tells you where you are in the city. It's about $200 a year, you can get a capacity, which is all about $1,200. Another bad footprint of providing something of utility for the kind of Put the material out. Play and play, uh, play beat. This is a project that hasn't gone on the next phase, and it, it, re it relates to a design idea that I'd like to see realized in more places. And that's where you, when you take some kind of activity that has meaning in the community and you translate it into a piece of per a permanent urban design. This is something that the Cambridge Art Council did. Uh, it was a oral history project in which older women in Cambridge told their life story 
Uh, and then they they each uh, created a uh, square in the city quilt, which was done for the Rodney County Museum. The giant quilt, as you can see. And what I think we should be doing as a, as a one percent for public art commission, we haven't done this yet. It didn't even occur to us. It was a, it was a, it was a, that that quilt, which has the invested meaning of all those people, and transplant that into a physical apartment. Could be another done by another set of artists in the tile, for example, and crosswalk around the city. Because in fact, there are more people who care about this thing than we'll probably ever be able to get in a strict design project that we conceive as commission. But it requires a level of humility, which I don't think we necessarily learn in the work. This is a, another kind of example of that principle, and it's the only one I can find, actually. That is a sign that at the entry to a historic district in Hammond, Louisiana, the little carving above the word Hammond is actually the carving of a cake. Why a cake with a building on it? Because when they first got the idea of trying to save their old downtown, they had a downtown street festival in which women created these large cakes, and each cake had a different historic building uh, done in the pastry brought them. And they sold the cake, they raised the money, they did a historical survey, they were able to get their uh, downtown on the National Register of Historic Places, and they started to renovate some of the buildings, the tax tax fund. And so they managed to raise the sign, and they recalled that earlier experience of the festival, and it made it now a permanent artifact in the downtown. It's a very modest idea, but in a sense, it, it again it creates an echo, it creates a kind of resonance in the place. And you might think of all the ways that create that sense of resonance in the work you do in the future. So that something echoes in the mind. Well, you might wonder what that is. That's another piece of car of brick. And it's in a new hotel outside of Dallas, a low Manitoba hotel. And this was done using union labor uh, in a commission that was not, part, not mandated by 1% for public art. But merely the fact that there were four different competing bridge contractors who wanted this job. And one that one was the one that brought an artist in as part of his team. The artist carved a series of, I think, 20 different scenes uh, which lined the walls of this first floor of this large building, a series of panels about the policy of the Southwest. I show it because I'm more interested in the technique of doing something decorative again uh, after years in which the decorative uh, tradition was seen as a, a kind of sin. Uh, ornament is ornament is crime, you know, or that uh, property is that ornament is crime. Uh, but we're coming back to that, I think, because ornament, in fact, is one of the very easy ways to try to create some sense of context. In this case, the building stands by itself. It doesn't really have a context or the technique of how the labor unit was involved in doing the actual work. Rick Carver cut the wet brick, fired them, numbered them, and they were put up by a late body union crew. Even something like a power substation can be transformed if this, uh, this approach is used of having artists involved at an early enough stage. I talked about the struggle to make that happen. I, I think that we are out of practice in terms of working uh, together, artists and artists, uh, architects and designers. This is an example where the artists were chosen at the same time as the landscape architect was chosen for a power substation in the neighborhood, we call it neighborhood. And they totally transformed the way you see a power substation. They created a kind of trellis that you walk through the station, they color coded it, and on the right, there's a collection of whirly games by two ancient folk artists who were collection was about to be thrown out and the entire collection was purchased and put into this little whirly gate park on the right. The art landscape architect had tremendous difficulties in working with the sweat. They had a special artist, a painter, and a sculptor who were assigned to work with that landscape architect. And they together evolved this design, which changed dramatically. As you can see, the whole idea of, of a the chain length fence has been pooped, transformed, and softened so that this little 
chair and table outside are made out of the same material. And there's a very whimsical sign inside that warns you that it's the power of flesh. And I'm saying that we can begin to transform this country if we start to develop that kind of procedure. But I don't think it's going to happen just as a, as a matter of goodwill. I think there has to be a kind of technique to develop. And I call that an environmental homework. And it requires that we do more homework. We don't leave it up to the artist. But I think the idea that the integrity of the artist demands isolation and reserve. And that right now, the country is filled with works of public art that are not accountable at all to play. Occasionally, they work very well. But many of their works are for, for galleries. They're not works for public play where I think the very notion of being in the public requires some accountability to the public, some accountability in terms of meeting, some accountability in terms of context, some accountability in terms of participation. And I think the only way to do that is to, is to develop what I call an environmental profile, which you have a written statement which defines how the space is used behaviorally, so you can't ignore that lesson. What the physical design constraints are, the middle of the historic district, it might be a different vocabulary than what kind of traditions of crafts there are in the area which might, which the mind might relate to or pick up on? And what kinds of mental associations there are with, the, with that particular environment? What traumas have happened here? What extraordinary interesting things have happened here? It's amazing the things you can find out through a workshop in which you present old photographs, you have a tape recorder running, you have newspaper articles, and you allow people to just sort of free associate by a place. This happened to me in Stanton, Virginia, not too long ago. We did this for a couple of hours, and after it was over, somebody said, you know, the most important thing on that street was an old man, an old black man, who used to shine our shoes. And he would say, he did this brilliant job of shining the shoes. It was about the only job he could have in his town. But he really hated his position in life. And he would do this fantastic job, which then allowed him a certain amount of aggression look up after he finished, he would sort of, sort of glimmer at the person and he would say, that's the best I can do. It's sort of challenging. And that sort of phrase, that's the best I can do, echoed over time on that street, the main street in Stanford, Virginia. And an artist came up afterwards and said, well, that's, a, you know, that's an extraordinary idea. Why couldn't you take and do, obviously, a bronze shoe statement with that phrase? Because so maybe the shoe is exploding and the words, that's the best I can do, you become a kind of puff of smoke or a puff of explosion around the shoe. Something that small, which again can echo the tunnel of the mind. I want to show uh, some ideas about how this can be applied at a, at a larger scale. This is the first project that we worked on, which involved a considerable scale. This is the Bethesda, and I showed this in the Washington Post, because I think it's an important change to add to it. Here we were able to use some sort of fancy building techniques to get this sense of cooperation between artists and developers and architects. It wasn't always easy. And we saw that the, the fact that the paper called it a beauty contest. Each of the developers, in order to, uh, to get the extra density that they all wanted, had to uh, have a public art plan and it had to have a particular place making component. So what we did was to go to each of these and to talk about the place and show them slides of analogies of various other areas and just kind of massage every aspect of the project. We talk about doing some stairs, we wanted to know how the horizon is. We said, if you're going to do a, a little kiosk in the front, why couldn't it uh, relate to how the image of the theater, which we're going to require the same star? So we did all that. We did that. The artist knew Rocky is now doing a pavilion. Well, it is how it's a willow a glass panel, which will echo the fact that there's a willow garden theater inside the first building in this project. Mm -hmm. This is a, the area that we're working in. It's a, around a metro station in Bethesda, Maryland. High density, so we can do this kind of thing. Tremendous demand, rapid transit, and the and very interesting notion of taking the number of automobile trips that can be generated out of the space putting an absolute ceiling yeah, on the amount of square feet yeah, in the so space to well. space that support in terms of automobile oh, yeah. You create a very arbitrary standard of a cap, yeah. then you reduce it down to a certain percentage and allow people to build up to the difference if they provide these extra things, public art, housing, open space, and open space management. 
the worst way of acting in programming space. That's probably the state of the art in terms of using incentive programs. It obviously will not work if you're in a party downtown. But it's an effective tool for getting teams of as many as um, six artists to work on each development project for a million six hundred thousand square feet of new construction. This is the first of the project. These are the different uh, artworks that are in it. There's a sundial in the front, through which you see uh, a little fountain at this side of the building, through which you see a clock tower, which will be done by an artist that will have a special mechanism that you can watch that will change on the hour. In the pavilion, there'll be a series of small chess boards that are built in the pavement, uh, and a series of little fountains that run through them. Then the whole pavement pattern will be a larger chess board, through which a flash walk takes you into a gallery, which has a sculpture at the end of it, a series of smaller sculptures along the side. The gallery is maintained by the development and becomes a permanent facility for art. The major column coming down the far left there will be worked uh, in, a, in the same way as the uh, uh, sculpture element of the, of the sundial. So they will pick up the same theme of the uh, sundial, which is actually lightning flashing on the on the element of the column. How to do this on an earth design scale? We decided that we could encourage the two kiosks on either side of the main street with Thompson Avenue to become the kind of gatepost to this environment. Each of them done by a different artist or artist. The one on the right is be made out of shimmering glass. Here would be a willow uh, kiosk. One on the left, you saw. On either side, a series of inserts in the pavement. The risers are done in tile. Uh, they're on either project. You look into the building, and there's a, a sculpture that pulls you into the building on either side. The whole idea was to try to use the uh, project to market the building so it's not getting an isolated work of art. It has a deliberate strategy to improve the marketability of the space. The other end of that downtown is a new bank which use the notion of a, of a wildflower garden of a horticultural strain as their idea. The landscape architects had a rather simple idea we thought at the beginning. They would do a garden. It wasn't very expensive. And that would be their fee. We said, oh no, that's not enough. We want you to take the fountain that you've talked about. We want a mosaic at the bottom of that fountain that has a series of floral reliefs. We want a three or four story uh, stained glass window that is of a tendril of plants coming up on the side here. We want a series of uh, mosaic patterns in the floor. We want the wrought iron fence along the front of the stage to carry on the idea of floral patterns, which of course is part of the early 19th century ironwork, and that there's a uh, late 19th century house there in the program. So that's the way we began to work with these different teams. Now looking at another project in Boston I showed you a minute ago on a much smaller scale. We're doing a plan for this building, which Try to put all these different components together and have them implemented over time. Taking the, the notion of a freedom trail, a cultural pathway through the city that's going to very boring now, using that as a basis for the first work, which we decided would be a sort of city carpet to commemorate what used to be on that site, which was the first uh, public school in America. No one knows that anymore, though all they can see is this plaque, which we just passed by and never look at. So the idea was to do something in the pavement that would relate to our research. We discovered there were ancient century games that were played around that school, one of the hopscotch. So why not do something that animates the street? So we did a hopscotch game with the imagery of the school in front of it, a Latin quotation to challenge those few classes in our society to still speak Latin, and a series of panels of all the uh, early scenes of that school, all done in ceramic and brass. Again, a very modest oral piece of the original city space. Is there an abrasion that's on that? Now moving from an old environment to a very new environment. What do you do with the, with the earth renewal spaces, the great dead space of the Muncie uh, courthouse in downtown? What a ghastly <laughs> triumph of the 1960s. <laughs> uh, how many years do we regret that urban crime? I don't, I don't know how long it would take Muncie, but it's all awesome. we're looking at our courthouse. We still survive back there behind this new curb building, which is across from our new city hall, Franklin City Hall. This plan done by Ian Pei and Sasaki, winning awards 
uh, but never again being seen uh, close up. Never the details were thought about. There was never any program to animate the space. There was never any idea about how the space was going to be used, except as a kind of decorative motif seen from a bird eye, bird's eye view. So you go through this dark cavern, which is not inviting from those steps through that entrance there, through the dark cavern up to the courthouse. And then you see the series of absurd bollards, uh, the shades of the 60s. You can no longer go through the main entrance. The whole urban design reason is running the space has been blocked because they have now put the public around the side to give a bomb scare for the 60s. And this is the great space we have here. The large uh, circles of the uh, brick donuts are uh, in fact ventilator shafts. There's a constant roar in the space for the parking garage below. Because there's a parking garage below, you have to have the pot. Nothing to grow on this side except over to the left. You can see there's a pattern there, which again is very pleasing as you in the air. This is the way the site looked 100 years ago. Part of our research is trying to always left the shape. It was a little bit like Lewisburg Square, for those of you who knew that. This is how it looked in 1920 or so, with the courthouse built on one side. There's still a couple of buildings left. The one on the left and the one here from that original residential track. Well, people still want to use the space. There's still sun part of the time and the shadows from the small buildings don't just cut across the space. I hear the roar, it's not too loud. You see the ventilators below. Probably the most difficult problem we could get, and one that we are addressing as a result of the commission for the bench and bar task force of the city of Boston. We are eventually going to tie to all the major law firms to pay for these improvements. Uh, people did want to sit out here. We thought, how can you animate that space? Well, one of the ideas was that we could have the bar association a function here. The bar association had no sort of space to meet. Why not have new American citizens have their squaring in in front of the courthouse? You could have lawyers sworn in here. In fact, we could have the uh, 5 o'clock news, which uh, you know, tells us what's going on in the courthouse, take place out here to read in the the broadcast. So there's what we thought about is doing something on the edge of this tree line section to sort of focus the space like this. And the idea came up, and it came from the judges themselves after a, another workshop meeting with the lawyers, to have a judge and a bench where there are a lot of proposals as to what that should mean. And the first idea was to actually have a regular bench from inside, taken outside, and clunk down the space. But a sculptor pointed out to us that that would be like putting a bathtub outside on the front lawn. Mm -hmm. There ought to be some kind of reinterpretation of what that meant. So you did a bathroom. The one artist came up with the idea of doing law books. It would be like this. I could hollow out behind it. It would be a whole uh, sort of place to sit in. Another writer came up with a sort of rather fashion uh, classical uh, <laughs> And a winning design was somebody who said, well, there's an urban renewal project here, and they tore down a lot of these old buildings. Why don't we find a fragment of one of the old buildings and bring it back? And that's what they did. And this artist bought those $5,000 in capital from the columns of a nearby bank that had been torn down when this space was built. You put this capital back in the space, and then you hollowed it out in the back so it becomes a piece of sculpture. Behind us in television trucks without us trying to even make the sound. They've been taking over the optics every day for five o'clock. They use this podium as a place for broadcasting the news and talking about what's going on in the court. It's also being used for carrying in new American citizens, including the wife. I can't read that either. But these are a series of points. Uh, which deal with uh, what we're trying to achieve with the public art strategy. And the words were, I think, connection, direction, animation, and interpretation. Those are four things that are trying to achieve with public art and public space, which in a sense are a radical reinterpretation of what public art is doing. But if you look at the work of someone like El Greco, for example, this picture of Christ being driving the uh, the uh, honorable people out of the temple, you realize that uh, great artists have always been able to take direction. Uh, that in fact, the context was often very, very given uh, that the patron 
was usually a person of considerable intelligence and sensibility and exercised that sensibility. And what I'm asking really is that we have better clients today who will demand more things. I think that the creativity of the result does not deprive the artist of its integrity, it merely uh, creates sort of a constraint uh, from a more effective kind of creativity. Well, to show the last crazy example of how this might be done, I would like to close this particular uh, live lecture with uh, new work, which has just been finished in the last uh, couple of months. This is a large scale project that we've been asked to do by the Moss Foundation in Flint, Michigan, which is an old auto town uh, where the great strike took place after the world motor that is being shot, and where uh, you live today. Flint, Michigan had its own Flint car at one point in time, and Billy Durant, very General Motors, and then went off on his own like so many American entrepreneurs, and started other car companies that make the Flint car. We've been asked to do some gates to the city. We thought one of the prevailing industry of the city is going to be automobiles. So here you see uh, an effort to take something that was a given, which is that they were going to put these chain link fences across the interstate bridges to stop young Jewel and Lincoln from throwing pebbles at cars. They were going to spend $50,000 in the wedding anyway. So why, why not have a budget and create the imagery that we like with the automobile? <laughs> One effort to do that using the foot ornament in the uh, lamp of the lamp. <laughs> Another more realistic uh, image was the arches that used to be down the main street of the lamp, Brick Street, Dragon Lab. I don't have a picture of these somewhere, but the idea was to take those arches, here they are in a beautiful city, and do it again on the freeway scale. So so again, we're trying to do something on a larger, compelling scale here that evokes the meaning of the place. Why does Flint run on a speedway superhighway? They know the driver is. I'm just going to say, that's what they do in Jesus' name, because they're the main up on the embankment. Oh, I see. Finally, two more pictures just to show you a level of humanity that goes beyond the historical things we did earlier. This is a design competition that we entered recently for uh, a gateway to Santa Monica, California. And it shows what I hope we can do to try to work design and get a holistic approach. There's also a variety of different uh, artists and artists to be involved. The art goal was going on here, but possibly the way a lot of Wilshire Boulevard in Santa Monica would, would be treated. We called it Wave Gate, Sea Shimmer, because it was in the ocean from the very point. So the tree has been repainted uh, with turquoise to give you a sense of wave. Uh, along the side, there are a series of, of tiles that are made of abalone shell and green tile, which is on the sidewalk. There are a series of palm trees which have been wrapped with a, uh, a plastic which picks up the glow of the headlights at night. <laughs> There are a series of green searchlights that will intersect the block and four of the spaces and create a gate at nighttime so that it can work during the day and night. The idea is that every year that the uh, sea has to be repainted by school children, so it has the idea of participation. You know now, like any spray paint time, you can spell out the word Santa Monica. Santa Monica is here. So that they also serve as benches. And each of them made out of green tile. Uh, so they're a permanent artifact in the environment of Santa Monica. Seen at a highway scale, which you're moving down sequentially. Uh, the There's got to be some groups you can make out of there. Out of the Santa Monica. Santa with the palm tree. Well, I, I hope this is the most comprehensive realization of the notion of white painting. There's new materials and a highway scale that will come in the next couple of months. Thank you very much. Thank you. 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 Um, out of all this thing, I come to the notion that people want to have meaning in the environment. I'm reminded of a, a book by Professor Juan Carlos Bonso, who you may have read, called Architecture and Interpretation, <laughs> which he said near the end of it, <laughs> Architecture and I hope I'm uh, doing more of these kinds of like making strategies that involve animation, that involve participation, that we'd be able to realize in the environment 
a sense of proprietorship exhibited in the other room speaks to the proprietorship you had in the early New England Green, where people actually felt physically and personally accountable for what went on in their space. And I hope we can translate the notion of an ethic, which we had in the natural environment. And remember that all the Leopold writing some 40 years ago in Wynn, uh, Ben County, all that. And I talked about that ethic. He said, an ethic presupposes the existence of some mental image of land as a biotic mechanism. We can be ethical only in relation to something that we see, feel, understand, love, or otherwise have faith in. And I would like to say that we as designers and architects, and landscape architects and planners, have a responsibility to translate that notion of an ethic into the built environment so that we can create something that is very related to it something we can see, feel, understand, love, or otherwise have faith. Or, or just in that. Okay, that's all. Thank you. Come on, you've come all this way. No, we didn't come very far. We came all this way. Okay, I'm done. Let's go. We got 13 times. Hey, we're out of here.